real. And then, and then we're uh, going to open up to some questions. I, I, you know, I, I find that you guys probably have some solid questions. Good warm up. Yeah, this is my first presentation uh, for um, going across uh, North America doing a presentation on this. And I actually really love your organization, your group. I know about your group uh, a lot. I actually know most of you, I think. So anyway, I'm blabbing. Once again, I blab too much. I'm going to start uh, doing this share screen. So we'll have a, a Q and A um, after the, the the presentation. So get your your pencil greens out. <laughs> Write those down. Right, everybody can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, you're good. All right. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So we, yeah, we, I didn't, we uh, see the whole screen, but we don't we don't see it in presentation mode. You don't see the presentation? You just see me? We see the presentation, but we see also the sidebar with all the individual slides as opposed to presentation mode. Oh yeah, no, okay. I can change that. Okay, here we go. Right? Perfect. Okay, good. Woo! Yeah, this is a good warm-up. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> We're coming out and yeah so um i've written a bunch of guidebooks i started writing guidebooks years ago i i'm on, on to uh, almost my 20th book it was kirk Wepper that actually got me started uh he basically said you're one hyper person uh you're all over the map uh choose one thing and i said what's the one thing and he said uh do something to get people out there because if we don't get people out there we can kiss wilderness goodbye so i started writing guidebooks that's the main reason i did that and also i found at the time uh which is a long time ago the, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources used to have these pamphlets showing you canoe routes, and they weren't doing that anymore. In fact, they were they were getting away from that. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to do that. And, um, and that's what happened. So the, uh, whoops, um, I did the, the top 60 canoe routes, the top 50 canoe routes, and just uh, recently they updated to the top 70 canoe routes. So I'm gonna go over some of my top favorite ones. A lot of them that you would know as well, and some that you would know uh, and you should try out. We're gonna start from the southwestern uh, Ontario and we're gonna move up to northwestern Ontario. And we were so lucky to have so many canoe routes in Ontario, in Canada to be quite honest. I, I do travel a lot in, in other places. For example, I'll go to Wales or England in Scotland and I'll go to their symposiums there and I'll present about what we have. And I got to say the last time I was there, which is just two falls ago, there was a young uh, man that was presenting on some river in uh, Wales and he was very excited. He didn't see anybody for 20 minutes, 20 minutes. He was very excited. I was the next person up and I said, well, here's a canoe route I did and I didn't see anybody for two months and they can't fathom that. So we have so much more than you can ever imagine here in, in our country. First one I want to talk about, the Sasagin River. It's actually along by Lake Huron, uh, uh, down by D Detroit, actually, a really, really southern uh, river. But if you've never done a river before, if you've never been to southern Ontario, really try this out because it's a very easy river. And um, it's a very beautiful river, beautiful scenery. I wouldn't do it on a long weekend, but during the week, you won't see anybody. You can do it in a whole bunch of series of day trips, but you, uh, I think you should do it uh, as a full, um, you know, three or four night trip. There's conservation areas where you can camp along the way and even campgrounds along the way as well. So yeah, it's not a wilderness trip, but the scenery is stunning. The other one that I really uh, um, love is the Thames River. It, it's a Huck Finn feel to me. Um, I, I grew up in Milton, Ontario, a uh, farm community uh, um, in Southern Ontario. And we, we, we used to do a whole bunch of rivers, like the Grand River, the Credit River, and the Thames River. So a few years back, I thought, I'm going to paddle the whole thing. So I went to, to the tributaries of the Thames all the way to Lake St. Clair. It took me 10 days, and I just absolutely loved it. A lot of people said, we just, you're just paddling a ditch. And I went, yeah, I am paddling a, a ditch, uh, and it's full of development. But once I was in that ditch, you really didn't see a lot of that development, to be quite honest. If I had to choose um, the best section of that river, to be quite honest, I, I, I'm not saying you should do the whole thing. I would do the whole thing again in, in, in a heartbeat. But I would go from the, the town of London uh, through Kamoka Provincial Park 
and in at Delaware. It's probably the one of the best sections that holds its water. So that's the problem with southwestern Ontario to find a, a, a river that can hold its water. And I would say that that's the thing. I had a blast. I mean, uh, because I'm doing the, the low version of this, whatever, I was going to show you a video, but you can go to YouTube and watch all these videos. But the one night, uh, I think it was the second night, I actually couldn't find a place in in London, Ontario, the, the city of. So I actually booked a really fancy hotel and I actually put the tent on the bed and slept in the tent and ordered a pizza. And yes, that is not a wilderness trip. And we'll get to wilderness trips in, in, in a bit. But I got to say, I would do this trip in a heartbeat. Uh, I, I I had such a great adventure doing that. Core of the Highlands uh, is where I live. I live in British North now. I used to live in uh, Peterborough for a number of years, but now uh, I, I live here. It's fantastic. Actually, I, I'm on what's called the hill. I can see uh, Shawang Lake from my window. And I, I did not know this until two days after I bought the place. The First Nations elders came up to me and we did a smudge and I said, what's up? And my laneway is the old portage uh, going out of uh, Shuang, um, it's been phenomenal. But the Kuala Highlands, if I had to choose one river to do here, it would be the Mississauga or Mississauga. And uh, I do this river all the time. Why is because the Kuala Highlands is a very busy provincial park. It makes sense um, because it's only two hours from Toronto. So a lot of people go here to try their first route. They kind of scare away from this river because they look at the amount of portages. But what I would do, I, I mean, I would do the whole river. It, it's great river. But to, to avoid all the shuttles, my daughter and I, for many, many years, have done this. We've started at the dam. Uh, used to be able to start down below that, but you can't park there anymore. But you start at the dam, and you go down to the first chutes and camp there. And then you go back up uh, stream to, to your car. And that's a really great weekend or, or a couple of night um, trip. Because there's not really a strong current until you get past the chutes. After that, there's lots of rapids. And... Actually, most of those rapids you can run. A lot of people say, well, I don't want to do that river because you have to portage all the time. Well, you really don't have to portage all the time. You can run a lot of those uh, those rapids. But a really great trip is to go down from the, the top, go down to the middle, and go back up again. And I've done that 10,000 times over. Why I love that river, it's very biodiverse. Uh, it has a lot of unique species. I'm a birder. So if, if you're a birder um, or a herptile person, this is endless herptiles there, then that's the place to go. The York River, uh, yeah, th that's uh, one of those gems, right? And um, it, it's one of those ones that a lot of people don't think about. It's it's just n n outside of Bancroft. It was going to be a provincial park at one time. Back in 1972, the, the, the government was going to make it a provincial park. It also, well, the reason why it was actually one of the main tributaries that um, the First Nations already used, but also the ex explorers and everybody else used to get into this region and uh, from the Ottawa River. And so, uh, but um, they never made it into a park. But in, in fact, at one, when I first piloted it, they had portage signs and campsite signs because they're going to make it into a park and then they decided not to. So I wrote it up. And um, what I would do is I would start at Egan Chutes. Uh, it's a provincial park. It's a non-maintained provincial park. Uh, it, it's a place people go for walking. It's full of minerals. Uh, I don't know if you know about Bancroft, but it's, it's full of um, a whole bunch of different minerals. And then you go down the, um, th through the three chutes, three waterfalls. After that, it's kind of a meandering, sandy um, beach area. And then you go through uh, Silver Maple and Red Maple Swamp. And then there's a bit of rapids at the, at the end. And then you go into what's called... Um, um, uh, oh, it's a big, huge marsh that um, uh, Lawrence, the uh, group of seven painted. And um, uh, yeah, it's amazing. What you could go do, though, uh, is you can go st at the start, paddle down, camp at one of the sand beaches, and then just paddle back up again. You don't have to do a shuttle. However, there are uh, there is an outfitter in town in Bancroft that actually does a shuttle. Algonquin Park, which you all know. Uh, in fact, you, you know the whole probably the the uh, eastern part of the park, which probably to me is the, the nicest part of the park. It's full of pine instead of um, deciduous forest, which is on, on, on the west west side. And uh, there's endless routes. So I'm going to go over some some of my, my favorite. The Oxtongue River. Everybody just doesn't think about doing the Oxtongue River. It's because it's right beside the Highway 60 on the way in from the west end to Algonquin Park. And um, I, don't, I think they, they don't do it because they think that there's a whole bunch of other wilderness beyond that. And that's fine. But if you want a quick and easy, either a day trip or overnight or, or two night, 
That's great. There is a route you can do uh, down the Uxtong and loop back again up to uh, the start on, on, on Canoe Lake or some other access points. Um, that loop back is just full of long portages and marsh. I wouldn't do it. I would just do the river. And yeah, so you can access many places, but if you want, you can access the, uh, the, this right outside uh, the park right here, the park border. There's actually a little parking area there and portage in like, like 100 meters and do this this route and just do an overnight and camp camp at um, the falls there. Uh, Gravel Falls is, is amazing campsite. That, that, the reason why I like that is because it's not the provincial, it's a non-operating park, so it's it's crown land. So you don't have to make a reservation for Algonquin for that. But you could do the whole entire section as well. It's a really good uh, one to two nights. I take a lot of my students on that trip. Uh, it's a good introductory route and they don't feel overwhelmed about their surroundings. The Big East River uh, is just outside of Huntsville. And a lot of people that have heard about the Minas Link, the Minas Link is a brutal, don't ever do the Minas Link. It, it's a canoe trip uh, that uh, goes around Algonquin Park and goes through all the, the six watersheds. I did it uh, with my buddy Andy uh, when we turned 50, 102 portages, 68 kilometers of portaging. Uh, it took us three weeks to do it. The Big East River is usually where people give up. Uh, they can't go on anymore uh, because it's a strong current all the way up and you just have, you, you can't line, you can't pull, you just have to wade the canoe up. But going the other way is a really nice trip. It's a beautiful trip. And if you've ever been to, to Arrowhead Provincial Park and uh, saw the sandbanks and stuff of like that, it's just beautiful too. So what I would do is I would either start at Huntsville or even start at this place here. There's a little uh, a picnic area with a, with a parking area and paddle up the, the Big East to the area of, of uh, Arrowhead, camp on the right side, and it's all sand beaches, all cliff sand beaches, massive cliff sand beaches, and then put, just paddle back down again. So don't do the, the crazy uh, Big East that I did for the Minas Link. That would be insane. I would never do that trip again. Loved it. Wrote a good book about it, but never do it again. <laughs> the Barren Canyon, which you would know uh, probably more than I would, is, is just an amazing uh, place to go. And uh, you can go to Acre Campground. Acre Campground, to be quite honest, is a really good place too. I go there in the fall all the time with my hot tent and just stay at the campground and go paddling around that area. It doesn't get a lot of traffic. But yeah, what I would do is I, I would go stay at, uh, at Grand Lake and SS there, uh, camp uh, at either St. Andrews or wherever, or Stratton Lake the first night, and then head down. You could either go down the river, which I prefer, and then what I would do is I would go down the canyon. Now you could actually finish and get a boat shuttle. I don't think I've, I think once I did the boat shuttle when I was writing the guidebook, but what I usually do is I camp along the river just below the, the first rapid and I go back up and I go up this way uh, on, on the, these portages here and come back and sort of do a, a weekend a jaunt. I would say, though, before you ever do that, stop your vehicle and do the Barren Canyon Trail lookout first and have a look at where you're going. It's actually a better view up there than it is down there. You would think, oh, cool, it'd be really good to be down there. But this view here is better than it is down in the river. But a fall trip, amazing. The Nipissing River is my favorite uh, river in Algonquin Park. I'm an angler. I love brook trout. I think brook trout really, uh, you know, um, characterize a true wilderness uh, in one sense. You know, other people don't. It's a really buggy place. <laughs> um, but if you want to do the entire thing, you can start at um, at uh, North T, uh, not North T, uh, yeah, North T, and then head all the way down and do a full loop all the way around. Oops. You could do that, that is whole loop. That's a good 10 day trip. And it's an amazing trip, but you also could do the upper or the lower and do loops through there. If you had to choose between the upper and lower of the Nipissing River, do the upper. The upper is, is full of gigantic white pine, monstrous white pine, uh, POW camps, uh, leftovers there, the, the old, the old uh, logging camps as well. It's more tranquil, it's more tea colored. The lower is more lowland swamp. Um, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And there's a lot more wildlife and trout on the upper. So I, I would choose that. There is a cabin along the way, uh, Highview Falls. And yeah, you can rent it. Uh, it's there for you to use. It's full of mice and full of snakes. So <laughs> I don't think I've ever slept. I've booked it many times, but I've always put the tent outside and, and never slept in it. It's kind of cool. It's really hot inside, really buggy. 
but it's kind of a neat historical place to go. I love the Nipissing River. I, I, I do recall the, the one time, in fact, my last time I was there, we camped at Grassy Lake, I think it was called, and we saw eight moose pass us by while we're just cooking our dinner at the campsite. It's amazing. This is a uh, sort of, I, I love this area, um, Naganosh, and I, I it's now a non-operating park. I have a feeling, probably not this year, but next year is going to be a, an operating park. Because when I was there uh, last year, I saw portage signs and campsite signs. So, so that is an indication that, you know, the, the Ontario Parks is sort of saying, okay, it was non-operating and we're doing a management plan, but so many people are going to this now that we have to actually manage it, which is a good thing because it's not that far from Toronto, to be quite honest. It's near Perry Sound, right? But it's there's endless amount of canoe routes. And if you can get a chance to go there this year or even next year before it's non-operating or even when it is operating, but right now it's basically crown land. You don't have to pay. There's campsites there. There's endless uh, um, places to go. It comes from this old canoe route uh, pamphlet, uh, Minatawan River uh, Canoe Route, that was actually in an old book called uh, Canoe Routes of Ontario. And it's a loop you can do. You can go down the Minatawan River, which is actually uh, Bill Mason's uh, family video when he uh, was with um, Pass the Paddle. Um, uh, uh, but when, when they're going down, they have lunch uh, at this rapid and they're portaging around the rapid. And I think they have lunch on a rock. It was not Lake Superior, even though the whole video is. A uh, film is based about Lake Superior. It was actually in the Minata one they're on, and it was actually um, on Graves Rapids. Actually, uh, I, I know that rock. <laughs> and so, yeah, you can go down down the Minata one. I if if you're not a white water runner uh, to the extreme, I wouldn't do this section to loop around. I would come down from um, from here and then go through this area. This is amazing. This is uh, this Trout Lake area. I I I've many many times I've actually come down here camped here and then gone back up or actually gone from um, this access point, there's a marina here and paddle up and then camp here and then come back down. But there is a loop you could do and it's a very easy route uh, except there's a couple of long portages at the end. They're not really rugged portages, they're just long. Like I'm talking 800 to 1000 meters. But overall, this is amazing route and right now there's no fee structure for it. So it's a really good area to go to. Here is my map of, of the of, of the route itself. Uh, again, again, you could do this as a loop, but it, if you don't know how to run shoots in class fours, you, you're going to have to be portaging through here. This area here is also a really good weekend trip. There's an access point along the Highway 69. You come back, you go up here and camp, and come back down again. Little tiny uh, little lakes here. They're just hidden gems that are full of really nice campsites. Okay, so we're moving on here to um, to uh, the French River area, uh, more north. We're going more north now, and uh, we're looking at the uh, the uh, French River's old Voyager Channel. So this is the lower delta system, and you can do a whole bunch of routes. Uh, one one is called the Figure Eight. You can do from here, and you go out into Georgian Bay, which is amazing. The scenery is incredible. It, it's this granite uh, white pine group of seven look to it amazing fishing but just note that this area here along uh georgian bay can get a get really busy with boats um sailboats and motorboats and stuff like that so it's not a pristine wilderness the reason why you would do the french is the scenery uh, for number one and also the history this was the pathway for uh, the first nations and the voyagers and explorers everybody that made canada the way the way we are today went down this route so if you haven't done the French, you got to do it just for that reason. But you'll love the scenery. My preferred part of the of the French is the Upper French. So this is um this is actually on, on the east side of Highway 69. And what I like to do is called uh, the 18 Mile Island Loop. It's a four night trip. You start out off at Little Pine. Um, there's a there's a the lodge here, uh, Pine Grove uh, Lodge, and the great paddlers, and you can park there. And you go down the French, and again, this is where Bill Mason did a lot of his work, the Blue Shoot area, where he opens up one of his films, that, that's that area. So you can go down here, go down the French, and then go up uh, up the um, the north channel of the French, which is Crown Land. Uh, so you'll have to reserve going down this section, but up here is Crown Land and do a full loop. Or 
I've done this more times in the loop. I've actually gone from Pine Grove Lodge and paddled it down to the chutes, a little bit further down below that, and then paddled right back up again. It's all possible to do, do that. I have actually done a lot of film work in, in the past. And when, they're, when the filmmakers are looking for a, a, a section of the French to do, that is exactly what we did. So if you watch uh, Ray Mears, um, uh, his um, whole video series of going across Canada, and we're on the French. That's where we where we filmed right there. The Mattawa is on the other way. It's actually going, um, you know, uh, down towards the Ottawa. Uh, it's it's actually really well maintained. Uh, it, it's a uh, it's a heritage river, and there's you know uh, really easy portaging, and it's also again a sense of history. Uh, it's only a two night trip. You can start out start, stop at this place here. This is where the uh, First Nations would get Oka um, to do the native paintings. There's a cave there it's supposed to be haunted. So good luck to you, to you all going in there. Um, but yeah, um, it, it, it's a it, it's a great route, uh, especially for where you are in Ottawa. Uh, if you haven't done it, give it a try. Water level dependent, but I I've done it in the summer and there's not being an issue. Now, this is amazing. The Ottawa River, which you already know, but I'm, I'm telling you, the Ottawa River, uh, Upper Ottawa, is phenomenal paddling because I don't think the big motorboats are doing it anymore uh, because probably the price of gas, whatever. I don't know. The only negative thing about the uh, Upper Ottawa paddling is the campsites, they're there, but you got to find them. Uh, nobody maintains that this for, for canoeists. But it's big water, no portaging, and incredible scenery unbelievable scenery that the cliffs along the, the the quebec side is just incredible so you can go from lake to uh down to mattawa or you can go from mattawa down to actually where the des moines river comes out at driftwood provincial park those two routes uh i would do in a heartbeat okay let's look at tomogamy one of the best routes for Tomogamy is the Lady Evelyn. Yes, the south part of, of, of Tomogamy is great. Uh, Lake Tomogamy is, is amazing too. I actually just uh, um, a, a year ago, I think I did a whole circumnavigation again just to map it out and put it in the book. But Lady Evelyn River is, uh, or Lady Evelyn Lake, first of all, is actually kind of nicer than Lake Tomogamy. It's not as busy. Yes, it's busy, but not as busy. Especially the south end here is incredible. I would just spend a whole two weeks camping right down here. But you could actually go um, from Moas Landing, which is, means there's only one portage around the dam, which is a little lift over, go across Lady Evelyn, and then actually go up and then check out Maple Mountain. Uh, Mountain. And it's not the highest point of Tomogamy, um, but it, it's the most scenic of all the points in Tomogamy. So the only thing is I would not camp at uh, Tupper Lake because all the camps camp there to do Maple Mountain, and the bears have got to to figure that out. So if you're going to have a bear problem, it's going to be there or Diamond Lake. Diamond Lake and Tupper Lake are the worst places to deal with bears. Um, uh, and I'm not talking nasty, evil bears. I'm talking uh, herbaceous bears that are used to getting your food. But anyway, check out uh, that that the, the Maple Mountain. Uh, Ispatina Ridge is the highest point in Tomogamy, and I've done that. That's a great route I can talk about. But the scenery is nothing compared to actually uh, Maple Mountain. And then from there, you actually go up the Lady Evelyn River and then go down the Lady Evelyn River. And I got to say, it, it's incredible scenery. The portages are really steep and it's almost like a giant has got marbles out of his bag and thrown them across the portage. It's full of all these round rocks everywhere. So just be careful on it. But the falls and the scenery is far worth the effort. Uh, it, it's incredible uh, scenery. And um, yeah, you head down here, you can go past Hap Wilson's uh, Eagle Lodge cabin and maybe he's there, wave at him um, and to talk to him last night. And uh, yeah, and come back and you could either come back um, uh, through this area here or come through these series of lakes. And if you're looking for a place, if you're, especially for a bass angler, just go down here and stay here for a week. Those lakes are incredible. They're really nice. Uh, it's not really well used. Um, the fishing is incredible. The bass are like four or five pound smallmouth bass. And I shouldn't even be telling you that, but it's a really good spot. So here's a good shot of the Lady Evelyn. So that's a typical portage. And just think majority are like up like this, not flat. So there, there's boulders everywhere. So just be careful. I got it there for years and we used to use Wanigans, which, uh, are great, but I don't want to carry one ever again. 
So look at that. Like that, that's Fat Man's portage, and you, photos don't do it justice. But the the, the portage is straight down a down a mini cliff. But look at the waterfalls. Incredible. Incredible spot. Love Tamagni. The Sturgeon River, uh, I would say this route here is one I would do every single year if I could. Uh, it's my favorite trip because it has so much variety of all the things I like. So what you do is you start at what's called Chinakuchi, which is it's a non-operating park now. They're going to probably make it into a park soon. And um, if you've ever been to Clarny Provincial Park, the scenery is the same. It's the Laclache Mountains. It's white quartzite with turquoise water. So you're paddling through there uh, and you're going up the Chinakuchi River. So we're, we're really it really is not much of a river. Right? There's no current, whatever. It's a series of lakes and small little rapids you go up to. And then you get into these series of lakes. Uh, then now you're in Tomogamy. So you see the old growth uh, white pine. So you're leaving the uh, quartzite in, and you're going into granite. And then you're getting into uh, uh, the Sturgeon River. The Sturgeon River to me is the big sister of the Spanish River. If you've ever done the Spanish, it's a, do, a, a, a good doable river for novice people. This is one step up. And um, a lot of people don't, don't do it. A, a lot of camps do it. So you'll see camps uh, on there, like Camp Kuwait and stuff like that. But uh, but yeah, you basically go down there. The portages are steep, rocky, but doable. And you get down to the lower section, and it's just this meandering, meandering. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? But you'll see lots of wildlife. And then you either take this long portage across or these series of portages that are, are maintained now by whoever is doing it. I would find this section here is easier now than the long stretch across this long stretch across is long but it's flat but I, I the last time i did this route which was, was long ago I, I this section was easier and then you come back to where you started so you're doing this incredible river trip in a loop so you're going through quartzite mountains like clarney you're going through clarney or, or, or tomogamy uh, white pine um you're going through a meandering river full of wildlife full of walleye and full of waterfalls and it, it's a loop but you need at least six days i would i would actually say eight to ten days for this trip for sure uh uh for that along the way years ago i met these guys uh it was a, a camp group the, the one kid i think i've picture it yeah he broke his his femur actually uh really bad so we uh we got um, a helicopter come and get him before that we met some evil camp girls <laughs> They're like really evil. They were spray painting their name on a, on a cliff face and they left a bunch of trash that I picked up and I gave it to them and they threw it at me, <laughs> told me what they thought of me. And um, so when we were fixing this guy's leg and called a helicopter in, the helicopter came in, but the camp girl girls that were uh, upstream from us, they waved at the helicopter. I don't know why. And the helicopter thought it was them that were in trouble. So they landed, which was not easy. Uh, and then they found out they didn't need help and then finally found this guy and then it was getting dark so they had to wait till morning they raft them out to the rapids the helicopter picked him up he had a broken femur he was almost dead uh from, from a blood clot actually and what happened was uh it went to court uh in my journal which i never got back uh it's still in evidence but the, it went to court and the, the government sued the camp girls camp uh for for whatever they did for thirty two thousand or thirty seven thousand and uh, the court won, like they, they got sued uh, because they waved a helicopter and didn't need it. And uh, they needed my journal for evidence and I never got that journal back. There's the helicopter. Don't wave a helicopter if you don't need it. The Spanish river, unbelievable. It, it's a really good novice trip. If you've never done a river before in your life, this is probably the one you should start. Water level dependent, but this year, the way the way winter's going, maybe not. I, I would do it in the spring, but uh, it's a good summer river if water levels are up. And the reason why is all the rapids are class ones. Uh, and if they're not, they're really easy portaged around if there, there's a drop. But um, but the majority is like this, this one rapid. It goes through this canyon. It's got to go for like two or three kilometers, just a constant Swiss. That's all you're doing. An amazing scenery, incredible. You can do the the east branch or the west branch um, of the Spanish. The west branch, uh, before you get to what's called the forks, is quite pulled and drop, and you need some whitewater skills for that one. But it's it's the east branch that is the easiest. So you want might want to do that. You can actually do this by shuttling, um, uh, by car, or you can do it by train. You can get the train, and they'll drop you off on, on the river, which I think is an incredible experience. And they still do that, and I just checked. They're still doing that this year. 
Mississauga River, if you ever read anything about Gray, uh, Gray, Gray Owl, this is his territory. This is where he was Archie Blaney, the ranger. His ranger cabin is along the route. It's not too exciting. But when he wrote about the river uh, later on in life, uh, it, it's still what he says it, is, it was then. Massive pine, red pine especially, and uh, incredible area. It's a, it's a long trip, a, a good eight day, maybe 10 day uh, from biscuit tasting down. You can shorten it by actually coming up. I think I have a map here. Yeah, you can actually go up here to what's called Lakasaba Lake and come up into Mississauga Lake and come back and just go back. And there's a route you can do here. I, I put in one of my books uh, through here as well, but it's probably best just to come back uh, on this route and um, just visit that whole area by not doing the entire river. So if you're looking for a four or five day trip and you want to experience that area, then yeah, just uh, go to Lakasaba, come up into Mississauga. You can go to where the, the cabin is. Uh, there he is. There's the cabin right there. There's a picture of it. It's private property. Um, usually nobody's home there. Uh, so you can go visit it, but you can't go inside of it. It doesn't really matter. It's not that exciting. But the pine that are there are unbelievable. That is that was well worth the whole entire visit, especially the red pine. Ranger Lake Loop. Uh, back in the uh, 1930s and 1940s, 1950s, it was a huge route the Americans used to use. Now nobody goes to it. If you want to catch brook trout and see no one, do this route. It's not maintained, but it's an incredible route. So you actually go to Algoma, uh, and you can start it. Um, actually, you can start at Ranger Lake itself, uh, or you could start just before Gong Lake. This road here isn't the greatest in the spring. It could get flooded, so check it before you go. You might have to start at Ranger Lake, but if not, you can start here and go through Gong and go up the uh, West Abinadong into Megasin Lake and then loop around. This route here is pretty rugged. Uh, this, uh, I, would, I wouldn't say it's a river, uh, the Nush River, it, it's a creek full of log jams and stuff. So have a good time, it's a great route, but what I would kind of do now <laughs> is I get flown in from Ranger Lake. There's a outpost camp there with a, with a, a, a bush pilot. They fly you into Megasin Lake and then paddle back down and it it's a would be a phenomenal five day brook choke uh, um, trip or just a trip to get away from people. This is where I was introduced to canoeing when I was 12 years old. My dad and I were at a fishing lodge, which is no longer there. It's abandoned. Well, it's still there, but it's abandoned. And uh, we went into some side lakes with uh, with a, a Grumman canoe and caught lots of trout. And I decided that the canoeing was the best thing ever for me. And I never stopped it ever since. So the white, the white Lake Provincial Park. Um, I well, I wasn't going to show this uh, uh, tonight, but but they the park said that they fixed the problem, so it's dammed in three places now. So this is incredible. It's got a whole bunch of history. You actually go from White Lake Provincial Park out to Lake Superior, and you finish at Pakasa National Park. And uh, incredible trip. I've I've done it many times. Loved it. It was one of uh, Bill Mason's favorite route to do when he wasn't filming. When he when he wanted just to have a holiday, this is the river he did according to my sources, <laughs> but they did damn it uh, one time. And then I did the river at, at the time and I went, oh yeah, okay, um, that's fine. And then they damn it two more times. It's not the river it was, but according to the White Lake Bridge Park, they fixed all, all up and this year they're opening up as a canoe route once again. So the scenery is incredible. All right, we're going North now, my favorite place. And yeah, the Still River Loop. Oh my goodness, this is uh, not an easy trip, <laughs> but it's it, it's it's what a lot of people are doing right now. It's become the lost canoe route that a lot of YouTubers are doing now, which I really highly admire uh, for them to do this because I know this trip is not that easy. So this is actually north of Lake Superior. You start at Santoy Lake. Watch the winds on that lake. I, I I've never been on that lake where when it was calm. Uh, so you start at Santoy and you go up what's called the Diablo Portage, Devil Portage, which is actually up a cliff. There was a First Nations elder that actually had just cleared two years ago a bunch of portages in this ring here. And I went up, I think, two years ago to check them out. And it's easier than the Devil Portage. But at the end of the day, it takes just as long. So I'm not sure if you want to do those or, or not. But um, there, there, are, there are there. It goes through two small lakes here into Diablo. So you go up and that's a brutal portage and you head up through uh, Carragon and up through this area. This is all burned over a few years ago. So it's a burn over area. Fishing is incredible. You've got what's called blue walleye, which are um, uh, subspecies of walleye. They have a blue tinge to them. There's a chemical uh, in them, makes them blue. 
And then you head up that river and then you hook up, uh, not the, that river, sorry, in the lake system. Uh, then you hook up into the Stur uh, into the Still River, the Still River, and you head down the Still River. Now, you could just do the Still River. There is an old logging road you can access on the top and forget about the Diablo Portage and forget about all those lakes and everything else. You can just do the river and do a shuttle. There's an outfitter that, that will do the shuttle for you, or you could do your own shuttle. And it's an easy four or five day trip to be quite honest. So the river itself is not that difficult. Lots of uh, class ones, class twos. And then you uh, head down from there and um, uh, oh, oh, and you finish at Santoy Lake as well. The only big problem is this lower stretch here, which is maybe why you want, can't want to get out at this logging bridge here. There's a bunch of log jams here and every year they're new. So they get piled up more and more depending on the floods. And sometimes you'll find a portage around them and sometimes they'll, they'll be washed out. Uh, you can pile right through. I remember doing the river once. I was like, woohoo! Uh, but other times you're like, I can't believe it. I'm not talking just like a bunch of logs. I'm talking a wall, a massive wall of logs and you have to get around them. And it's all this, I wouldn't even call it sand. It's more, more like silt. You have to walk up. And so it's not an easy trip, but if you want serenity, uh, willingness and a challenge, try the Still River. The Turtle River, uh, I really like because it's got the White Arthur Castle. Jimmy McEwitt, poor guy, 1914. Uh, he uh, he had a lot of money from gold. Uh, he found gold and then lost it all. And then uh, he, he was living in a shack <laughs> all alone. And then he mail ordered a bride from Scotland. And she found out he was living in a shack and she decided not to show up. So he built her this castle uh, on his own. He brought in all the material in, built it all on his own. And then uh, he went out fishing one day and he drowned. And then, yeah, they, the, the rangers, I think it was two years later, I think it was two years later, they found him, found him dead. So they buried him right in front of the castle and the castle's still there. That's worth it, the whole visit. So what you could do is you go to Clearwater Lake. I wouldn't do, um, you can you can access it from the top end, um, um, from Ignis. Uh, that's the old route. Uh, last time I did that, no, I wouldn't do that again. The portages are not maintained at all, and they're, they're just blowdowns everywhere. I would actually go from Clearwater Lake, go across that lake, and then go into White Otter. In fact, I would just spend an entire week in White Otter Lake itself, forget the river, and visit the castle, visit POW camps uh, that once was there, visit uh, White Beach campsites. Um, it's just a glorious place to go, and it's all crown land, non-operating, so you don't have to pay for anything. Or you could do the river. So you go down, and it's called Turtle River because there's First Nations paintings of turtles uh, uh, along the, the rock faces. And then you head down uh, from there, and you go and you finish at Mine Center. It's the town of Mine Center. The lower stretch is kind of like Southern Ontario. Like the species are all like red maple and swamp land and everything. So it's totally different than the upper. And maybe you, you want to put out at, at the bridge and not do the lower stretch, uh, to be quite honest. It's but this whole, whole one lake here, El Trot Lake, is just full of wild rice. But if you want to see a golden eagle, you know, there's bald eagles are like all everywhere. But if you want to see a golden eagle, I uh, go there. You're going to see tons of them. It, it's a nice spot. And the fishing is incredible. The Kapka. The Kapka River flows out of Wabakimi Provincial Park and goes into Lake Nipigon. And uh, it was one of my favorite trips I did with my buddy Andy. We did a trip north of that and then then into Lake Nevcon for five weeks. We went on a five-week canoe trip. It was incredible. But the Kopka, to me, um, you can actually fly in, but that's way too expensive. You can go fly into Uneven Lake. Uh, right now, flights are way too expensive. So I would take the train in uh, from uh, Armstrong drive to Armstrong, take the train in, and then uh, let them know uh, this, where you want to get, get dropped off, and they'll stop the train, and head down this area here, which is non-maintained, <laughs> but it's all doable, and then you head down the Kafka, and this is the section of the Kafka that's incredible, so I, I would say that, you know, instead of flying in and, and wasting your money, just take this part, part in, or, to be quite honest, I would e even go here at the access point they have along the ro road here, and pal up, and just camp right here for a couple of nights and then pile right back down because all the major waterfalls, I'm talking the Seven Sisters, are there. That is where the scenery is. So if you want, don't want to do this whole entire area, but you want to visit it, just go to this access point, pile up here, camp at the waterfalls, and spend the entire time there. And I'll show you the waterfalls. It's incredible. It's like the Amazon. Wabakimi is a great place, but it's very lowland, very eh. That lake looks like the same lake I just paddled. Eh. 
It's like, um, you know, the low James Bay area, but the Kopka is not. It's like drop, 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 massive waterfall, massive waterfall. So there's the train. There's going in through Beagle Lake access point. So again, it's not maintained, just to remind you. <laughs> and then you got the waterfalls. So this is what you're dealing with. That's the seven sisters. So you go through, you portage around all those waterfalls. They're incredible, absolutely incredible. But if you're portaging around them, uh, there's one portage around the last one actually that you literally have to use a rope to lower yourself down. You can't, you can't go down there without a rope. So it's almost like climbing, climbing gear right here. I thought it was a joke the first time I did this. I thought the people were with me. They brought climbing gear uh, with them. And I went, come on, it can't be that bad. It was that bad. So uh, there is another way around that falls to, to the right instead of river left. I, I tried as well. And there, you, you don't need a climbing harness on it, but the rocks and rumble around it is not worth it. Uh, it's better to do the other. We continue further down to Lake Nipigon. Uh, the crew that was with us when I first did this river stopped at the first access point. We continued down the river into the north end of Lake Nipigon, and we spent some time there exploring. My bucket list is to paddle it all the way around Lake Nipigon. It, it's a vicious lake. It's, it, it, it gets really nasty and, and bad water, uh, it, but it, it's an inland Great Lake. But the scenery is unbelievable, and you won't see anybody at all. You'll see pelicans and woodland caribou and brook trout. Woodland, uh, uh, woodland caribou adventure park. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I prefer this more than Wabikimi. I think it's more scenic, to be quite honest. It's more dramatic. It has more changing of lakes, a changing of fish species. One, one minute you're catching lake trout, one minute you're catching walleye, then you're catching pike. Um, what we did, uh, we went up to the Blood Vein River, which I've done before, but we actually went from the Blood Vein and then we paddled back down uh, to uh, Armstrong. And the reason why I would suggest highly to go to do the blood vein and not do the blood vein, if, if you don't want to do the blood vein, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of work to get, for organizing that whole trip. It's to just go to Artery Lake. And what we did went, went from Artery Lake and did a section of the blood vein and then came back, back down is the First Nation paintings are incredible. Like I'm talking hundreds of paintings. It's there's nowhere else. And I've seen all the paintings that, well, not all the paintings, huh, all the known paintings um, in, in, in uh, uh, Canada or especially Ontario for First Nations paintings, but nothing compares to our Artery Lake. Maybe Quetico Lake in Quetico, maybe. No, no, uh, Artery Lake has them all. In fact, we found more up top of the cliff inside caves that were actually white color, not, not red. It was incredible. Oh, and the fishing. Just put your toe in the water and catch fish. <laughs> All right. We're getting to near, near the end here. All right. Uh, so, yeah, this uh, I, I did a, a small version of what uh, of what I'm presenting across uh, on my tour or whatever. These guys are helping me out. Uh, thank them. They're all my good friends, to be quite honest. I've known them for a while. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop um, sharing the screen and get your questions. So, Kevin, would you like to read the chat or would you like me to read it to you? How about you read it to me? Okay. Um, so I got one question in there and, and one comment. So anybody who would like to add questions to the chat, please do so. Or if you want to actually say something, uh, raise a virtual hand or uh, turn off your camera and flap your arms. So question on there is... Uh, What's the current situation regarding fences across rivers in southwest Ontario? Yeah, we call yeah. For action for river, for action for river access, decade plus ago, a canoe was dumped by a fence on the Nith River, which is a good-sized river in west of Kitchener. And you saw one on uh, Avon, which is tributary of the Thames, uh, that was up for years, throwing it right across up uh, uh, river level. And I'll add one other story. Uh, I digitized the club archives and uh, came across um, some correspondence that we'd written to the government because uh, somebody had actually strung barbed wire across the river at around neck height. And uh, I don't know if it was a rapid, but it was definitely moving water. Yeah, I know all those areas, actually. So we'll talk about the NIST. 
Um, even though they're completely wrong what they're doing, you're not going to win that one. Uh, I, I tried. I, I grew up in that area, and that that they always put um, a fence across because that was their ability to farm. And it's the same with the Credit River. And it went to court, and Orca took it to court, and Orca lost, actually. And uh, that was years ago. And it's, it's still, there's a, um, there's a place there where you can either do a 20 meter lift over around a concrete dam, or you actually have to portage 1.5 uh, kilometers through town. And you have to do the 1.5 because the, 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 the farm person went to actually, he was an MPP, he was a political person. So he, anyway, he, he, they went to court and he said, well, I need it for my cattle. And he doesn't even have cattle. So I don't know what was going on there. Um, what I found out this year, and I wanted to share uh, tonight, uh, just the, the technology wasn't working. I had a whole bunch of uh, B-roll film from my Mississippi trip, but uh, things didn't work out. But anyway, life is life. But when I did the Mississippi River trip, that will probably answer a lot of your issues that was going on going on here. Years ago, I went to do the Mississippi River trip that was actually uh, documented uh, from... Uh, from Mississippi Conservation Area pamphlet, which is still on their website, and it it shows that you go from the uh, from uh, Bonneco Park all the way down to the Ottawa, and I I got that and I looked into it, and then a lot of people said, well, the canoe route's still there, but nobody really does it as a full route anymore, and I went, why? Well, because there's some landowners that own portages. I went, how can that happen? Like how how did a, a landowner own a portage? Like how did that ever happen? So that intrigued me especially as a writer they intrigued me and as a canoeist and found out that actually um by law uh it's the interesting thing in the mississippi river is like so i'm going off and changing here but is that the mississippi river was actually where the navigable waters act was created in 1882 so, so two log drivers were arguing one guy created a whole bunch of log sluice and then the other log driver used them and the other log driver said hey you can't do that those are mine and he goes oh yeah i beg to differ and he took took it to court, and actually, the other dry, log driver won because the court said if it's a navigable by a vessel, that being a canoe, they actually used the, the term canoe uh, in the archives. Uh, then it, everybody owns the river, and what they mean by owns the river is that it's a chain. So the chain, um, a chain from the river bed, uh, which is sixty six uh, uh, feet twenty meters, because in the old days they measured by a physical chain for surveying reasons. So so in theory, if you stay in the river, they can't do anything to you. Uh, but but also if it, if it was a navigable river, meaning it, it was a canoe route, they should never have sold off that property with that being a portage. So whoever did that was like, what are you thinking? So I did the river and thinking, okay, well, catch me if you can, see what happens. And in the old days, I mean, 20 years ago, I, I tried to do that river and I was stopped by some landowner. Uh, and it was it was the, the, the barbed wire fence mm -hmm. uh, thing. They put the barbed wire fence. Across. And he didn't have cattle at all. He just had the cottage. And I didn't bother with it at the time because uh, I thought I'm not going to deal with this hassle. But this time I'm like, no, I'm going to deal with this. I got to say, doing the river, I had no issues. Um, I had some issues. I met some landowners, but they kind of helped me along the way. I just wasn't a prick to them. Um, I, I kind of told him what I was doing. So I never really had any problems with doing the Mississippi River. However, they still said they own the land. I don't know the answer to that, except that actually I do know the court says that if it's a navigable water that was created in 1882, then if you can pile the canoe down it, then, then nobody can stop you from 66 feet from the center of the river up the shore. For us as canoeists, you know, just don't be nasty because we'll we're, we'll lose the rights because the Credit River, like even though they should never won in court, now you can't follow the Upper Credit River. So, yeah. Um, uh, comment on the uh, the nasty nasty girls. Uh, laugh out loud, loud and expensive lesson. Um. Nikki and Salmon say, big fan of Christine over here. Please, please say hi. Oh, great. Who's that saying that? Uh, Nikki and Salmon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and by the way, if anybody wants to talk, you know, I'm, I'm watching the, the virtual hands. Please feel free to stick one up. Um, 
So Paul has a number of your books, had great source uh, success with many roots. roots. Uh, one wrote in Lost Canoe Roots, has errors in the Chinaguchi route in the section of Lower Lake to Wessel Lake. Uh, what's the best way to tell you about any errors on your description? Uh, uh, send me a note. My email is on my website. My website's uh, kevincallen.com or even through social media. And you should send me those because my publisher gave me the rights to that book just recently. What happened was, they didn't want to republish that book, the Last Canoe Route book. It, it was never a big thing for them. It was a big thing for me because it actually reopened these Lost Canoe Routes before they were lost, right? And um, they, a lot of people were asking for it, and they, they, they said, well, we're not going to reprint it. So I said, well, can I have it? And I actually went to pay for it. And they said, well, okay, we'll give it to you for free. So I thought, okay, well, I'll self-publish it. And I thought I'll do that. Right now, I'm thinking I might just put the whole entire book on my website um, it, just for those routes. So if you have any of those corrections, and that's the problem with writing a guidebook, to be quite honest, not just the Lost Canoe Root book, but you think about all the books I've written, things change, right? Uh, root, roots change all the time. And um, it's never been a huge nightmare for me. I've never really got people saying I got lost because the, the root had changed. Because I, I think everybody gets it. The, the, the book was written in 1980. Then obviously it's not going to be the same. But uh, yeah, send me the information because even all, all my other books, uh, when they get redone, I always ask everybody, has anything changed? And I also go physically to check them out, like the Still River, the, those new portages uh, around Diablo. Yeah, so please send me that that stuff. I'm, I'm very open to that. Um, so from Jill, I have a hard time finding Ontario River maps where the rapid classes are identified. Any thoughts? Yeah, they, there, there's all, a lot of people would, wouldn't do that. There's only guidebooks to do that. Hep Wilson's books is really good for that, for uh, for river trips. I'll, I'll do the classifications. Uh, my books are, are, when you read it, I'll, I'll more tell you where the portage is and the classification. And people will say, well, can't you run that? I'd rather them choose if they're going to run it when they get to the rapid than me telling them if they can run it. Uh, but I will tell, the, tell, tell you the classification. But when you see the classifications too, when you do see them, Make sure you note about water levels because uh, rapids change dramatically in water levels. The Mississippi River, for example, last year, I went the first week of June thinking that there was going to be plenty of water, and there wasn't at all. I, we walked that river, and there was a section where people said it was unrunnable. Well, it, it was because we walked it. It was a, it was a creek, <laughs> but in the high flood water, it could be a class uh, three or even a class three tech. So. There's a lot of websites now to check that out, though. I would I would look at um, my myccr.com is still a good site. Uh, I would say that Ottertooth uh, is a good site. Algonquin Archives is a good site. Uh, a lot of forums out there and asking people. But there's also um, government sites that show you the the the, level, the water levels of rivers, uh, the gauge levels. And, and if they don't, then you contact any local outfitter and they'll just look out their window and tell you. For maps that show you them, though, no, like uh, even like uh, Jess maps that, are, that you talked to last, uh, last week, the guy is a genius, uh, but I don't think he has a class of rapids on, on his map. So, um, so Lynette's been a long time northern tundra traveler, but our carbon footprint will be keeping her closer to home, and she's very much looking forward to using your info for more local and more urban canoe rides. Uh, thank you for sharing the experience and helping out. Yeah, some local areas too that I I I, I actually I I I know I, I I don't like going back in time, but today I actually had a whole bunch on and I couldn't because I got this new laptop didn't work whatever. But I I, I wanted to show the Tay River, uh, which you you probably guys know more than I do. But the Tay River in Perth is an amazing um, one nighter. You go from Perth down to the 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 lift lock and camp there for five bucks a night and then paddle back again or do a or do a uh, a boat shuttle if or um, a shuttle if you want. But the history of that river is incredible. That's a really good day trip. The Mississippi, what I learned about doing that that area is that there's a lot there was a lot more day trips than actually a full eight day canoe trip like I did down down the Mississippi. I would say that if you go to uh, well, Crotch Lake in North Frontenac, um, to all the other lakes in that area, that's incredible. Even though it's a managed area, it's crown land, but it's managed now by the municipality, so you have to pay. But that's fine because you know you got the site. The section from uh, the one to show tonight, I, I had a whole great map to show you, but from um, Crotch Lake downstream from that, uh, it's full of just a series of waterfalls and it's an incredible day trip. And there's a public launch right at the end of it. 
it's a good day outing. You can actually, well, we camped overnight because there was one section that was Crown Land, just one section that I knew uh, through the Crown Land Atlas I found, so we stayed there. Uh, the other section is uh, upstream of, of uh, Mississippi Lake. That stretch, you can actually go upstream or downstream because there's no really strong current. It's just full of a lowland uh, silver maple, red maple swamp that's just incredible. There's no cottages or camps there because uh, it's all swamp and it, it's just full of wildlife. The other was a um, um, section of the Mississippi I really liked was actually uh, uh, just the, the last bit uh, where the arch bridge was. And if you go from the arch bridge and paddle it down to the Ottawa canoe and kayak um, outfitting group, or even paddle up from them, that is again a lowland section area full of uh, farms and, and cattle, Muanaya. Uh, this is a beautiful area. The other is the Rideau River. There's so many, do you even do the Rideau from Kingston to the Ottawa or, or Ottawa to Kingston? It doesn't matter, but there's it, it's a cool trip, really cool trip. Uh, and also, um, you're looking at the other places. Um, well, the York I talked about. But also um, Bonnachere. Bonnachere River is a gem as well. I, uh, speaking of the Tay River, I got on a Bee Ridge Locks, paddled up to the dam, uh, hiked around the dam, paddled down to Big Rito Lake, and then back to Bee Ridge Locks. And for that stretch be, uh, between the dam and Big Rito Lake, it's actually a very pretty area, but... There are two things to think about. Um, I did it in the summer, and most of the river was this uh, fairly wide with a big flat rock underneath it. And so I was able to find, use my uh, whitewater river reading skills to find the area where there was six inches of water instead of three inches of water, so I could <laughs> paddle up. But the, the, the thing that would put a stop to me doing it again is uh, right where the river goes under the road to Port Elmsby. Uh, on either side, there's a cottage and then no way to get out at the cottage with this honking big R3 pool and drop. And so it's not that difficult, you know, if you're uh, experienced with whitewater, but you don't want to haul a whitewater canoe down all that little niggly stuff. Uh, on a flat water trip, and I don't want to take my lightweight flat water canoe over a great big R3, and you can't portage around it. Yeah, it's difficult when you're when you're in the you're in southern Ontario, uh, especially eastern Ontario, and you're looking at routes that are all doable. But that if you have to get out, you have to, you know, either catch me if you can or or ask permission. So I do. I know the Salmon River is a good example. It, I think it's the Clay River. No, the Clay River. What's the you know where Puzzle Lake is. Uh, I go into Puzzle Lake, but if you instead of going to Puzzle Lake, which is a non-operating park, which is is great, it's getting a little busy now. People have found that out. But but if you actually go on the other side of the bridge, if you want to do the salmon, but there's another river. I I, sh I think it's the Clyde. It goes into Tweed. It's an incredible river trip. But if you look at it, it's actually owned by a logging company. So I thought it was Crown Land. I went there a couple of times and even camped there, thinking I was fine. But then I looked at the Crown Land Atlas, and it, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's they actually do own the uh, the shoreline. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Janet is saying that uh, she read the Spanish River, even the Easter Branch, isn't really for the novice paddler. Is there a shorter section that would be a good place to start? And can you recommend to put in a takeout just to get the feel of it? Yeah. So the, the what? So I I, my, I might have messed up. The, it's the West Branch that actually is pull and drop from Biscotasi to the Forks. The East Branch uh, is a novice, and uh, you can either start at the series of lakes that drop through, or you can actually get dropped off at the train at the forks and go from there to what's called the bend. Um, so get a shuttle there instead of going to Agnew Lake. If you go all the way from the forks down the, the Spanish to Agnew, from the bend to Agnew Lake, there's some good drops. They're, it's all easily portage, though. I mean, you, you can't run them, but they're all easily portage. But Agnew Lake is just a bore. It's it's dam controlled. It's like, are we there yet? It's boring. So you might want to get out the bend. So if you actually get a train ride to the forks, paddle it to the bend, and there's an outfitter there that will drive you back to your car um, from the train, it's novice. Like, um, I mean, the worst thing you ever do is just get out and walk uh, if the water level is a problem. So. Um, piece of advice from Lynette, uh, never ever 
uh, count on anybody out there's river classifications because, uh, as you noted, uh, conditions change, water level changes, winter runoff, et cetera, uh, always result in different classes for each rapid. Uh, people have to take responsibility for uh, their own safety by doing their own scouting and assessments. Oh, definitely. Uh, I, I I do know I, I've had it with other people where they'll just blindly go around a bend and because they'll be looking at a guidebook. Uh, I In fact, I was on the Petawar River and they had um, the author. It wasn't half. It wasn't myself. It was something else. It was a, someone did a guidebook on the Petawar River, a little booklet, and they they were actually reading the book going down the rapid. And and they pinned on on a rock and they blamed the book, <laughs> and we we helped them. We we got their canoe out and they were complaining. And I was, guys, like it's not the book's fault. Like if you didn't get out and look at this this um, rapid, well, it says it's a good teachable rapid. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. Like uh, so, yeah, it's uh it's one of those things where we always mess up once, but if you mess up twice, it, it's nobody else's fault except yourself. <laughs> So a uh, couple of comments uh, while I'm waiting for somebody else to put in with a uh, a question or a hand raise. Um, do you remember the story of how the stop sign came to be at Crooked Shoot on the Petawawa? Stop sign at Crooked Shoot? So Crooked Shoot Rapids on the Petawawa is about a kilometer of R1 stuff. Yeah, it's where, the, that, where the cross is, yeah. Yeah, and then you whip around the corner and, and it gets really nasty. And so there are three takeouts. The third takeout is just before the shoot, and there's a stop sign on it. The reason is, a number of years ago, two couples were going down the river, and they knew they were planning on camping at the third takeout. And uh, they knew that it was really easy up until then, so they are just paddling along, and they missed probably the second portage sign because that, that one's easy to miss if you don't know where you're looking. And they went over the chute. And I think one person died and a couple of people were really badly banged up. Well, and they were really upset at the park because the park didn't properly label that it was the third takeout. They didn't make any great mention of the fact that uh, they knew they were coming up to really wicked rapids. And they knew they didn't know the route, but notwithstanding that, they weren't wearing their PFDs. I did not know that story at all. That's, when did that happen? Uh, I want to say the 90s. I may be mistaken. Wow. Because the similar thing happened to the the, the Mississippi River, the lower Mississippi, uh around the, um, the Big Falls uh, going into uh, the Moose River. Uh, a, a bunch of people drowned uh, because the old topo map shows the old portage on the right and it's not, it's on the left. So now when you go there, there's a gigantic billboard showing portage <laughs> on the left and people, yeah. people are like, wait a minute, that's not a wilderness trip because it is a wilderness trip. The Winston Abbey is like, you know, a wilderness trip. So when you go in there, do I want to see a billboard tell me where to go? Mm -hmm. um, with, with the Gonquin, a, a good case study for that was, I remember, um, a few years ago, there's a, a woman that died at Barron Canyon. She fell over the canyon. So uh, the, the husband or the boyfriend, I think at the time, was very upset. And then they asked the park, um, there, there should be a, a fence put along that trail. Now, if you ever walked to the Barron Canyon Trail, yes, you're right, right at the Christmas of the, of, of the cliff. So they wanted to put a fence there so nobody could fall over. And the superintendent at the time, he's not there anymore. He said, absolutely not. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing the stop sign thing, what you're talking about. And found out later on that she didn't accidentally fall. He pushed her. He killed her. It was murder. Hmm. So a fence wasn't going to stop her. <laughs> yeah. um, from Scott Campbell, uh, George Drought, question mark? Yes, George Drought, that, that, his guidebook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, really, really good guidebook and uh, actually really good old video. If you can find that on YouTube, uh, he, he did a video on that that river for that guide. But yeah, they they, uh, they were very upset with. Well, actually, they didn't they didn't say it was George Drought's fault. They said it was the government. They, they thought that George Drought's book was a government pamphlet, uh, but it wasn't. So, but they blamed him, uh, and it was not his fault at all. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Um... Well, one more thought, and I'm not seeing any more questions. But uh, 
Um, if you're looking for day trips, uh, club member Karen Hurd uh, a couple of years ago did a uh, one hour YouTube on uh, 40 day trip destinations within an hour and a half of Ottawa. Oh, really? What? Uh, I, I can watch that. Can yeah, you it's a, so I'll uh, put the link in chat for anybody who's interested. And she's working on uh, the sequel. Oh, that's and, fantastic. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it might get done this year. Or it might be part of next year's series. Um, depends on time availability. But, uh, yeah, and, and it's really interesting because it's how far the good and the bad and then so on. So it's a... Very, I don't know if I, I don't know if I watched that YouTube or not, but it, if she can actually send me that link personally too, that'd be great. Because it's so my partner. I, I've been uh, with her for about five years. She lives just outside of Kingston. So lately, the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of um, southeastern Ontario uh, trips just to get to know the area because I, I'm in the Quarthas and I know the Quarthas. I know Halbert really well. But uh, I, yeah, I, I, I just I'm really, really excited about exploring that 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 your region actually especially that's why i did the mississippi river everybody wondered why i did that river it's because i wanted to get to know the the, the landscape and yeah. uh yeah so just before karen speaks uh gail was kind enough to put the link to her youtube video in the chat so okay. karen so i am working on a uh, youtube video with 80 additional locations in eastern ontario almost all of them in eastern ontario um it should be out probably May-ish, but I'll let you know when it's out and it probably end up um, on the Canoe Club uh, list of YouTube links eventually. Um, I have a question for you though, Kevin, because I was doing the same Mississippi stuff that you were in pieces and I didn't do between Crotch Lake and Miller's Lake and Stump Lake. So I'm curious, you said there's some really scenic stuff in there. So which section would you recommend doing in that little area? Uh, absolutely Stump Lake uh, for a day outing. There's only two cabins on that lake. And uh, I don't know why, uh, but we got, I mean, it was full of cottages on the way in, but we got to Stump Lake and I didn't really film a lot of it because we're all, we're kind of hypothermic at that point. It was, it was really bad weather and uh, I didn't film much of that whole thing, but uh, I have gone back since to, to even paddle it and, and fish it, whatever. There is no crown land to camp on, even though in theory the islands should be doable. But I don't think I don't think they are. I think it's all private owned. But I, that's a beautiful spot of the entire Mississippi River. River. The uh, the section though from Crotch Lake, which you can do by going to the North Crotch Access Point um, or the South, it doesn't matter. But the North is closer, and then head down from there to 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 the Access Point um, before Miller Lake. Um, I would say it's a slog uh um the the group we were someone joined us i forget who they were uh two paddlers joined us and they were whitewater paddlers and i think they looked at us like why aren't you going to run this i went because it's a waterfall <laughs> and uh i mean they had the helmets on and the line ropes and they did all what they they do right but it was easier to portage around the portages were there uh so it was all doable it was bush portaging but it was not crazy uh but you're walking most mostly uh, of that entire route but it, it's a good outing especially to have lunch at the second or no, the third waterfall there's a nice lunch spot before you portage around along the road but you're not running that section um unless you're an extreme advanced paddler uh and you do it in good water levels the rest of the time it's full of sluice ways from the old logging days it, it's full of uh drop and shoots so uh, there's one section of the rapid we could have done and I got out to look and around the bend there was a log jam across. So if we actually kept going, we would have got pinned. Yeah. So, but, but at the same time, there's no development in that section. It's owned by a private landowner that used to actually invite people in, uh, in that area as, as history goes. I don't know the person myself, but, uh, and there was some controversy. He didn't want people camping there anymore. But now I, I guess things have eased off because I guess some people left some garbage and stuff. So there are signs there saying, you know, be respectful. Um, but I would do that section in again uh, if you haven't done it. So maybe people on this uh, you on this seminar want to know that on your YouTube channel, you have the Mississippi uh, report up there. I've watched it. It's fantastic. So even though you didn't speak quite as much on that tonight, 
um, there's quite a detailed report on what you did on the Mississippi. I know, Thank and I, I had it all. I, I don't know. I got the worst luck in the world. I got a brand new laptop. I actually worked for like three days on doing all this stuff on the Mississippi because I knew I was talking to you guys tonight. And I didn't know it for, I don't know, I couldn't share the screen. Um, but Kevin, we can all go and find it because you put it on YouTube. We can all get it. That's true. And the, maybe, the good maybe thing put the is, link somewhere. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. But also I wrote seven pieces for Explorer Magazine on that trip too. So if you want any more detail, so the YouTube is great, but there's more detail in the written form. And Explorer Magazine, if you go to Kevin Cullen blog, uh, the Happy Camber blog on Explorer, You'll read all those pieces. It will tell you more detail about it. I went to write a book about it, to be quite honest. After my trip, I was all pumped. I was, I'm going to write a book. But it, it, it's it's a really good article, but maybe maybe not a book. I mean, it wasn't long enough. Um, so I think it will be part of a book at one point that I'm working on, on, on river journeys. But it, it's like the Thames River. I love that trip. Uh, I, I wanted to write a book about that, too. But again, it was a 10-day trip. You write a book about a 10-day trip. It's not a book. But um yeah, I, I would do the Mississippi. A lot of things happened on that trip that, that I really didn't talk about either is that um, my buddy Andy, so he just got his hip replacement done. And if you watch the videos, his hip was done. Like he couldn't go because uh, we, we, we walked most of those rapids because there was supposed to be good water, but there wasn't. The upper part, we walked the entire thing. And um, so his hip was gone. So we had to change. So when we got to Mississippi Lake, I got a friend to to show us around and everybody goes well, why are you doing that and i went well because my 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 friend's really important to me and i want him to finish the trip and we we're going to end the ottawa river the only land issue we had the ottawa river was the last dam the landowner allowed us to portage through but he said you know you know you can do this and i went no but i'm going to tell everybody else to do it like there's a fine line there where if i go off in social media and tell everybody i did it then you're going to have hundreds of people trying to do it and at that time, I mean, I'm not knocking the landowner. I had some great opportunities with the landowners along the way, but he should never have had that house right on the portage. I, whoever allowed him to have that house there at the dam, because by law, you have to portage around a dam, by law, in, in Ontario or in Canada, actually. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of things about that uh, about that trip. What was the, the one, I, I gotta say, I'm glad I didn't paddle across Mississippi, Mississippi Lake. It was pretty boring. <laughs> Because what I did is I went back and did all the sections that I that I missed with Andy. And that's just a personal thing. I didn't document it. I just wanted to do it personally. And Mississippi Lake, no, no, I no, no, no thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And and uh, Karen, are, 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 when you write those uh roots up, are, are you just doing YouTube or are you gonna write up uh, up about them or um it will go up on YouTube probably about May. Um, but I have all this stuff written right now. Are you going to do a book then or? Probably not. I can send it to you if you want it. No, no. Why not? Why not? I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> Kevin, you should be our ghostwriter. <laughs> well, it, once it comes out, Karen, make sure to send it to me and I'll, I'll share it for social media. I would love, I'd love to ensure I would love to share the, 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 the river with you one, one day too. It'd be fantastic. We'll see you somewhere. Okay. So Kevin, I posted links to both your website and your YouTube page in the chat. Okay, great. So great. Anybody who's looking for the videos, go for the YouTube page and anybody who's looking for the books, go for the website. Um, Last call for any questions or comments. No. So uh, just a reminder, starting this weekend, Kevin is going to be out on tour. Um, are you coming anywhere near the Ottawa area? Um, I, I I don't have it set yet, but I'm going somewhere in Renfrew uh, this early summer. Uh, I was asked to go there. I forget the outfitter or gr group. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, I will be doing something. I'm not going to the Ottawa. I used I used to speak at the Ottawa um, uh, uh, outdoor show, but I, I'm I'm away that I'm on a trip on that that weekend, so uh, I'm away. So uh, that's still going on though, isn't it? The Ottawa show. Yeah, well, uh, the canoe club will actually have a table there. Oh, really? Okay, okay. Yeah, I used to go to that every year, but it, it's it's later on in the year too, and then I I end up. Um, there's a certain point where you present a lot and there's a certain point where you just go out in the woods. <laughs> um, 
So with that, again, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming out and doing this. Um, and I, I hope your book tour goes really well. Um, I'm going to stop recording now.